Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I think I should start with the Charlie story. My visit to Midland. <laughs> Because Charlie was there, it was January, right? And um, Charlie and his wife Kate were sitting to my right, and the next trustee was speaking, getting ready to give a talk, a briefing, or whatever it was going to be. And I turned to Charlie and I said, "I think I'm passing out." <laughs> and I went, "Boom." So he, people got excited and overreacted and called the uh, rescue squad. <laughs> and I had, um, I really felt that I had, was going. And I, I'm in a hurry to get there. So, <laughs> <laughs> so this was really fine with me. I was just going, perfect. I'm going to go out. Just like going to sleep with anesthesia or something like that, and you're gone. And you'll leave a legend of interrupting a trustee. (laughs) In the middle of a briefing. I mean, how, how hot shit can you get? I mean, that's... But unfortunately, the rescue squad got there, and the next thing... The three of us are in the ambulance. And the next thing, the three of us are in the emergency room. And we're, who are they? Are three hours? Huh? Five hours. And um, you never get admitted to an emergency room with a heart problem that you don't get admitted to the hospital unless Kate is along <laughs> to talk to the nurses and the doctors and uh, she is going in there and just giving them hell that you're not going to admit this guy he feels better and there's 800 people back there waiting to hear his talk <laughs> <laughs> so this little Korean doctor comes up and says to me Mr. Beach I'm releasing you and so we went back and uh, somehow gave a talk or whatever and came back to Tampa and then went to the doctor. And uh, and all this stuff started with putting a pacemaker in and <coughs> and it led to quite a adventuresome year. But uh, that is a one persuasive person. <laughs> Oh, I didn't know that. (laughs) Boy, I missed out there. (laughs) Oh. Anyway, that was how this year started, and uh, that's a great story. That is just wonderful. And as a matter of fact, you guys were up in the Tampa one time when she was helping me fix my feet and all this. Anyway, it said to um, reminisce, and I guess that's an opportunity to um, tell some meaningful things that have happened to me in AA. Um, well, I don't have the walker. I got too tired, but it's got a little Marine Corps flag on it. And um, there's two organizations that are pretty high in my life that I'm an honor to be part of. And the Marine Corps is one, and AA is the other. And they are really 
high up in uh, stature in my own mind. I think in spite of my um, childhood adverse reaction to the Catholic Church and all the smoke and mirrors and um, joking around that I did, I think I was always fascinated with God. I think I just, um, I liked the idea that there was one. Um, and But I didn't know what to do about it. But I think that's a good thing to have, is um, a curiosity about whether there really is, for you, a creator. Or was it all just an accident that uh, it, life doesn't mean anything and we're, we're going nowhere, so good luck. And so um, there's very little doubt in my mind that when I drank it produced a spiritual experience similar to what I thought you might have if you had a higher power. It was that type of thing. It was um, just revolutionary. It was just remarkable. And um, Dr. Young talks about that, that he, he believes that alcoholics satisfy their longing for God through alcohol. And um, ironically, that it takes um, God to solve the problem that we thought we were finding in alcohol. It's just an interesting observation. And while I'm on Young, I'll just go random, you know, who knows. I think it's interesting... In the, in the letter to Bill, where he later on, after the uh, Spiritus Contra Spiritum quote, he talks about um, the world in general and about a force called evil. Evil being, um, uh, you know, moving away from God. And he says that in the life struggle, people always lose to evil. They, they always end up losing unless they have a spiritual awakening, which I find just fascinating. That um, Now, I don't know if there is such a thing as evil, uh, for me, I, I think it's the um, part of me that doesn't want to stay close to God. We call it character defects. Bill is very clever how he uses the words here. I mean, I think he only uses sin once or twice because that's such a religious term. So instead of having sins, we have character defects. <laughs> it's, it makes you feel better. Yeah, at least I'm not a sinner. <laughs> I'm just a defector. <laughs> Which, um, but that alcohol, God, it was such a, it was just what I was looking for all along. And of course, there was no way to control it. And it, like all of your lives, it just took over. I would try to have just ten. <laughs> Which would have been just right. I would have just been not in trouble and all that. But you don't get to decide how much alcohol you have once the alcohol's in there. And so... Um, I got my dream of getting in the Marine Corps and um, becoming a fighter pilot, and I thought it was the greatest thing in the world, and alcohol decided to take it all away. And it did it very slowly. Uh, I still have a lot of friends, 
uh, and we call each other. I've been to a couple of reunions up at Cherry Point where guys that were flying planes that are in mothballs in museums now, they were the hot stuff in the 50s. And um, it's, it's, it's just... It's just a wonderful part of my life and a great memory. And I think the, if I remember, everybody who um, we hung around with had four or five kids. We had six. Big families were kind of um, in. And um, just like AA, where we're all fo- we have the big book and we're focused on this. The pilots, we would be talking to each other constantly about, well, here's a little trick. You want to learn this? This is a uh, just obsessive talking about flying. Um, and then the uh, disease just started. I would end up missing a flight. One time I missed... You know what? Have you guys heard the Wormwood story? Has anybody heard that? <laughs> My guess. <laughs> well, if you don't like it, I love it. I tell it all the time. <laughs> but I had um, done all my flying and had lost my flying career and was an air traffic controller. You can see how smart the Marine Corps was. (laughs) This guy is in such bad shape, he can't fly, so let's make him an air traffic controller. And I was in Japan in charge of an air traffic control unit. And the uh, senior enlisted men saw what bad shape I was in, so they would just go, Captain, here's your tent, you bring your bike down, we'll get you coffee, but don't you talk to any airplanes. Because we're afraid that you might run them into a mountain. I mean, we just don't want you to do that. So I'm in a squadron that was headed by an aviator, but it's what they call a base squadron. And they take care of maintenance. They take care of, like, the um, air traffic control, the motor transport. It's all the housekeeping duties for the uh, Air Group 12. And there was the, the colonel, who, the head of it was an aviator, but his executive officer, who was, a, he just was something else, was a motor transport guy. And he was always trying to um, get our squadron to have more spirit and all this, you know, like the fighter squadrons. So he um, has the colonel write a letter to the group CO saying that we just got announced from headquarters Marine Corps that we're getting an airplane, and we want to know what the call sign is. Now, this, these squadrons don't get airplanes. So the group CO, going along with the joke, writes back and says, your call sign is Wormwood 1. So we write back, thank you. Well, unbeknownst to us, this guy, this executive officer, is building an airplane in the hangar out of wood. Two-by-fours, hand-car propeller. (laughs) It had a pump engine from one of the pumps, and the propeller would turn slowly. Took a seat like one of these and just bolted it in. And the um, brakes were an anchor. You threw it out and then (laughs) hoped it in hook something and um, he had one morning we went down with the, we all got up early and went down to the hams flight line which they had their airplane there with a radio jeep and we called Iwakuni Tower this is Wormwood 1 over and the tower's going who the hell is Wormwood 1 and they said where are you we're on the hams flight line so they got the binoculars, and they see a plane over there with a propeller turning. And there's no record of this plane ever having come on the base. So this is a big emergency. And they get the MPs, and the red lights are coming, and they come over, and we're all laughing. And funny joke, nice going, guys. Even the group CO 
sent a note over. That was cool. Great. You know, you got me there. Ha, ha, ha. And then it sat out in front and Santa Claus was in it. And now we're going to Taiwan. The air group's going to Taiwan on a deployment. And we would go there first to build the camp, put up all the tents, the showers, the heads, and mess halls and all that stuff. So again, the colonel writes a letter to the group CEO and says, what flight is Wormwood flying over in? And just to make fun, the group CEO wrote back, you can go over with the photo planes. Okay, we're going to go with the photo planes. Well, you know, and I thought that was the end of it. This guy, Jack, he cuts the wings off, ties them up, around the plane and takes it down to a staging area where the cargo planes are taking the stuff and bluffs the pilots. And they go, what's this? He says, it's an observation plane. The colonel wants it over there. <laughs> I said, what? Yeah, this is, well, god damn, it doesn't look like it. Well, it is. It has to go. we got to take it. So they took it. <laughs> then we put it back together over there, built the camp, and the first one to land, bringing over the um, air group, is the colonel. And he sees Wormwood parked there, and he knows it didn't fly over. <laughs> <laughs> so he's very upset. And he sees uh, Jack, and he says, burn it. I want that thing on fire <laughs> within an hour. <laughs> and Jack never... Let's grass grow under his feet. We were at the Chinese Air Force Academy, Gong Shan, and he went up to the general in charge of the, uh, all of the Chinese um, air activities and asked for a meeting with him and explains that our air group has put together a gift for him, which is a composite of all the airplanes that flew with China in World War II. And he started naming the, <laughs> the different planes. And the Chinese general was flattered. He's going, oh my God, I can't believe you would do this. So Jack goes back to the colonel and says, you don't want me to burn that Chinese general's airplane, do you? <laughs> so they had a ceremony <laughs> like a formal ceremony to turn the plane over to the Chinese. <laughs> and uh, we're all standing out there, and the ceremony finishes, and they bring a tow truck over and hook it up to Wormwood, and there goes Wormwood. And a couple of weeks later, one of the guys said, you've got to go up into the middle of the school in the courtyard. And we went in there, and there's two pedestals and on one is a MiG-15 that defected from mainland China. And on the other one, it's Wormwood. <laughs> With a plaque under it saying, who knows, we can't read Chinese. And so, <laughs> so that was the kind of fun that we had. And at the other squadrons... Um, would have models of their airplanes at happy hour, you know, whatever it was, an F3D or FJ or whatever it was. And we didn't have anything to put in the middle, so we built outhouses for everybody to use, so he decided that would be our symbol, was a two-foot-high, one-holer outhouse with all the detail, a little doorknob and uh, half-moon up at the top, you opened it up, a little tiny roll of toilet paper. I mean, it was just perfect. And up at the top, you had to duck down to see it. It said, you will buy a round of drinks quietly. So we'd get people to come over and go, what's that? Oh, well, this is this thing. Where you ought to see the workmanship. Look inside. And as soon as they saw the sign, we'd start singing, you're in the shit house now. <laughs> They would buy 20 drinks, and they were allowed to sign the shit house. Now, once your signature was on there, if you talked someone into coming over to look at it, you got a free drink. 
and at the end of the year there was no room for signatures on <laughs> <laughs> those days are gone that's you don't hear those stories drinking is not um is really not a big deal in the military anymore it's a, it's a shame <laughs> Everybody's doing a great job. Nobody's getting in trouble. It's uh, really bad. <laughs> but uh, there is a problem with alcoholism because I know, at least in the Marine Corps, um, after um, tail hook in Las Vegas was about 20 years ago, the commandant said, we will not have any alcoholics in the Marine Corps, and that means sober ones. So you have to keep it quiet if you're in AA. And uh, it's, it led to the suicide rate to going up. And I've got a couple of friends who are really working on this problem. Um, boy, talk about an overreaction. Because shortly after I got sober, the Navy, some of you guys know Joe Persh out in California, Dr. Joe, you know him, and I forget the other guy who really started it in Long Beach. Um, this was a uh, lieutenant commander and a friend of his who was a Navy captain came to Long Beach and the captain was in AA and he asked him what he was doing for the alcoholics on his base and he said nothing he says well you're killing them you've got to start some alcohol program and he said well I'll never get permission from CNO, Chief of Naval Operations, to start an alcohol program. He said, well, then why don't you start one anyway? Don't ask. So he started it. It was the first military program. It was immensely successful. So much so, they heard about it in Washington and came out to look at something illegal, I mean, unauthorized, and it was doing so well, it became a model for uh, other services, but especially the Navy and the Marine Corps. And uh, the Marine Corps had all its uh, officers and staff NCOs go through one week of training around the country. And I remember in D.C., they came to this one motel, and we went over and gave talks to them. And pretty soon, the stigma had been reduced down to almost zero. And a friend of mine... Bob Eggers, who some of you guys may know out in the Los Angeles area. He was down near Laguna. He got promoted to colonel with alcoholism on his record, which is unheard of. Now, after Tailhook, it just went back and crashed. Where So it's an interesting story to uh, watch how... And the airlines. I'm, I've lost track of them. Sometimes we'll get... Mike to tell us, you know, Birds of a Feather was started to try and solve the airline problem, which was, if you have a known alcoholic sober pilot and he has an accident and the reporters find out, how are you going to be able to convince him that he was sober? Right? That was, that was the thing. If, so if you want, if, in the, uh, 70s at the airlines if you wanted to get sober you had to go on leave I'm going on vacation for a month and not tell anybody you went to treatment and then you came back and so that it was unofficial but they finally worked it all out with the FAA and the pilots union and all those things so it continues in certain professions to uh, create the same old problem. Um, when I think about removing the stigma, I think Rockefeller did the most to put a dent in that when he held that dinner in the 40s because um, people made fun of him what are you giving a dinner for alcoholics for? You know, why would you give a dinner for them? And he invited all his friends, the bankers and everybody, 
but the newspaper coverage of it talked about this Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, it really made people sit up and think that maybe alcoholics might be okay people after all and that they didn't have to carry the same stigma. Um, I think I'll just continue with um, this God thing. Um, when I first came in, in the D.C. area, nobody was doing the steps. There wasn't in. Buck Doyle was Mr. A.A., and um, he was already totally unselfish and unself-centered. He just gave himself to the whole program. So he was already where the steps are supposed to take you, and he didn't understand why people just wouldn't be like him. And so uh, a lot of uh, early sobriety was go to meetings, don't drink. Go to meetings, don't drink. Go to meetings, don't drink. And so um, while I became familiar with the steps, I didn't have any spiritual experience as a result of the steps but I had things happen that I could not overlook. And the first one was at my first meeting when that al lady came out. I was trying to leave, and I didn't know which way to run because the meeting lasted four hours. They had a dance and all that stuff, square dance. And I didn't want any part of this, and I'd only been sober three hours when I got to the meeting, so now I'm sober. <laughs> eight hours and I'm feeling terrible and I want to get out of there and so it's starting to sleet a little bit and I'm looking around it's dark out in Manassas and this Alanon lady came out and she put her hand on my shoulder and said come on back in everything's going to be all right and I believed her now that is a huge thing to have happen where you would believe that oh okay and went back in. And then about six months later, I was driving on the base at Quantico, and it wasn't a voice, but it was the same thing as a voice. And it simply said, if you stay in AA, everything will be all right. And I believed it. So those are experiences that were there that I couldn't deny so that if I got negative a year later I, I would look back and just go yeah but you had this happen you had this happen and it was very strong to rely on when all the doubts and all that came and uh, after a while it became the end thing the steps and the big book and um really start getting familiar and reading. And there was a group in College Park. One of the guys is down in Tampa now, Cappy. And they had, there were two groups that did this. They had someone come over and talk about three steps for an hour. And then you came back the next week and you talked about three other steps. And they had somebody else following you so that they were constantly going through the steps. So if you got signed up to go do College Park, you went there four weeks in a row and you had to talk about all 12 steps. Well, you're not going to look like a jerk, so you've got to study. You know what I mean? You've got to get the book out and go, oh, oh, oh. And I remember when I started over there with them, I would go, well, the one thing, well, yeah, on the other hand, you know, and I'd be going like that. Well, you do it often enough, pretty soon it really becomes a part of you in terms of mentally being familiar with the words. And as that mental familiarity got stronger and stronger, so did the power of the words. 
they just were. And um, I think that's when I first noticed the impact on new people of certain words and certain ways of talking about something. And, you know, if you're speaking and you pay attention, you realize what is powerful and what isn't and what really works and what doesn't. And that, those classes went on forever. And it led to um, starting Saturday morning live, which um, anybody knows Keith Lewis? Anybody remember Keith Lewis? He was a speaker. Yeah, there's guys around that knew him. Yeah, he was a wonderful person. So he comes to uh, D.C., and um, he's, he was in the Marine Corps. So we became friends, and he wanted to be me to be his sponsor. So I said, well, get some running shoes. I turned into a runner. Oh, you're going to go running if you're going to, you know. So he's huffing and puffing, but pretty soon he's a pretty good runner. And they uh, offered him a job at the Psychiatric Institute running the alcohol program. And he wanted to know if I would give a lecture on the steps to the patients once a week. Little did I know, he didn't give a damn about my lecture. He knew that a lot of people from Washington, D.C. would come, and that's where he'd get sponsors for the patients. So I was the bait <laughs> to get sponsors coming in to the treatment center. How about that? Your, pig, your own pigeon turns on you. <laughs> And um, so it did get popular. And pretty soon we couldn't fit in the room. So we moved up to a school, a Hannes and Harrison, Hannes Harrison School. And this thing was just slowly getting bigger. In other words, it, was, it left the treatment center. And then we went to Sibley Hospital, where we were for a number of years. That was my favorite location. And then we ended up at the National Institute of Health with their whole auditorium. And uh, at Sibley, we had bagels and uh, coffee, and it was, just, it was just wonderful. And at Sibley, we had, do you remember, uh, where's Dick? Do you remember Lenny? Where's Dick Martin? Yeah, you remember Lenny? Lenny was the street person that... Um, probably one of the great teachers that I ever had. He was this Irish guy, kind of, and he just felt very nervous if you got him in a corner. You know, if several people were blocking his way out of that corner, it would create panic in him, and he would bust his way through, and occasionally some of the gals would get bumped as he ran out of the corner, and that would require some patching and mending and so on down. And um, he just had a funny way of making noises. <laughs> but the big thing with Lenny was squirrels were his higher power. <laughs> and so when he'd share at meetings, he would share about, he's a nut. And squirrels know all about nuts. So he talks to the squirrels. And he did it so, in a way, after you listened to it for years, you are tempted to see if there's anything to it. <laughs> and I remember walking from the Dirksen building over towards the Capitol, and those big trees, and there's squirrels all over the place. And I remember one came up and was sort of looking at me, and I went, I'm a friend of Lenny's. <laughs> It didn't, it didn't seem to... Lauder knew Lenny, too, yeah, and George. And it didn't seem to do anything for the squirrel, so I wasn't sure, but... We had a, a retired U.S. senator that came to this thing. And um, one day, I looked out in the parking lot, and Lenny was explaining the squirrels 
to this senator. And I remember saying to myself, only in AA are you going to see somebody explaining squirrels to a senator who went to Harvard and, you know, all this stuff. But he was listening intently. Well, one day, Lenny wanted to ride. He had a bike, but it was uh, over in Georgetown, and he, he wanted to know if I could give him a ride over there. And I said, sure, Lenny. And this, we had a big snowstorm, and it was melting. So I'm driving over, and I'm, I've never been on the street. So I say to Lenny, I said, I bet you're glad this snow is melting, assuming you live on the street that snow is a big pain in the butt. And Lenny said, oh, no, I prayed for that snow. And I went, oh, boy. Now I know he's a little off wacky. He lives in the street. He's praying for snow. I said, Lenny, why would you pray for snow? And he said, well, when I grew up in West Virginia and, and we're going to school and you wake up and there's a lot of snow and school is canceled, it is the biggest present for little kids. And he said, I just wanted some little kids to be happy. And I sat there going, who's the teacher and who's the pupil? And uh, Lenny had a sponsor. I think his name was George. And there was some kind of a... Lenny had had a slip, and he was throwing bottles through Foxhall's windows, if I recall. And George went out to calm him down, and Lenny very accidentally gave him a bloody nose. And it floored him. It floored him so much that he disappeared. He just couldn't believe he did that to his sponsor. And we didn't see him for, uh, geez, quite a few months. And then somebody told me he was up at the, um, and I can't think of the insane place in Maryland, between Washington and Baltimore. No, it was uh, it's another another name. Yeah. Yep. So I went over there, and there he was. He's on the he's in the crazy part. And obviously, they got him on a lot of drugs and everything. So I bought him some cigarettes. So I said, I'm going to come back and see you. So I came back, and we went outside, and I said, Lenny, why aren't you in the alcohol unit? Why are you staying here? You're not crazy. And he said, they had me in the alcohol unit, and I went through... And they were going to send me back to Washington. And I got worried that if I went back to Washington, I might hurt my sponsor again. So I went over and put my head, tried to put it through a plate glass window so they'd think I'm crazy. And they moved him over to the crazy place so that he would never hurt his sponsor again. Now, I don't know about you, but that is uh, commitment. That is really putting the well-being, I mean, it's in a very unorthodox way, but in a way, that is an amazing, heroic decision. And I never saw him again. Lost track of him. But that's, um, those are the type of things that you just never forget. <laughs> And uh, God teaches us, there's all kinds of teachers. Some are standard looking, but others are remarkable. And sometimes it's the ones that are having a problem with AA. And we watch and see what happens. And we give up on them, and then they make it. And then we can't explain, well, why would you make it this year? You failed 21 years in a row. What was different this year? God's grace. It just, this is what happens this year. Then I had a great sponsor. And he was another Marine captain. He went through the same nut word I did. And uh, he was a man of few words. And the first three words to me were, get in the car. When he came to my house, I said, well, I don't know about getting a car. 
And I looked at him. He's a lot bigger than I am. And I went, oh, shit, okay, I'll get in the car. But I'm not staying around AA. And every night he'd drive over and get me. So we were the two military people. The only two guys in the whole Marine Corps base there. And then an Army guy came along who was in charge of the horses named Bill. And we had three. So when we drove up from Quantico, I would go to Big Mike's group in Columbia Pike. And he would refer to us as the military advisory group to Alcoholics Anonymous. (laughs) (laughs) Has now arrived at the meeting. And he was the first atheist that I met. Big Mike, big tough guy, but he was ship designer. And he'd give this talk and he's going, well, yeah, but I don't, I don't buy any of this. I don't. And he'd finish his talk and he'd go, God bless you all. <laughs> <laughs> so he was going to stay an atheist even though he had decided he liked God. So that's okay too. And um, his favorite story, he grew up in Bedford Stuyvesant in uh, New York and Brooklyn, and he liked violence growing up. He just loved it. He'd ride the subways at night and sometimes have a gun, just hoping that the trouble would arrive so that he could have a successful evening. And so when he got sober, he got teamed up with an Indian Another big guy who'd been released from prison for murder. He did his time. And so they would go to meetings, and they were very boring. So they started going over to Harlem. So they would hear stories that were more in line with their drinking. And they're at the meeting one night, Mike and this Indian, and someone had invited a... Park Avenue woman who had all the money in the world and lived up in the penthouse and all that, and she comes to tell her story. And she's talking about, well, I have this penthouse, and I sit and drink my wine, and my butler brings it over to me, and my little kitty cat sits in my lap, and I have the flowers growing in the other hot house, and they're all blooming, and things are wonderful. And the more I drank, the more my kitty cat didn't want to sit in my lap. And the more my butler looked at me with disdain when he gave me the drink. And the flowers began to droop. So I decided that I had gone down far enough. (laughs) And I joined Alcoholics Anonymous and my kitty cat sits in my lap and purrs, and my butler brings me a Coca-Cola with a big smile, and the flowers are all blooming. And, of course, the room is rather quiet, and she finishes. And Mike said he left, and they're walking up the street, and he turned to the Indians, and he said, what did you think of that? And he said, that's the most beautiful story I ever heard. <laughs> And so you just don't know how you're going to reach people and what is going to be left with people. Um, Once that Saturday morning meeting got going, I I suppose now I have... um, I don't know, 15, 15 to 20 years. And I started being interested in a lot of outside reading. I just found it fascinating, some of these concepts and thoughts. And um, I also was doing a lot of running, which can produce pretty spiritual experiences. And I do remember running and... um, (laughs) suddenly realized that the shadow I was looking at in front of me was the same shadow I had in Africa a couple thousand years ago. I mean, it was was as clear as a bell that this was. And those type of experiences, people will laugh at, 
But you don't laugh at them yourself because you, you're the one who experienced it. So when you experience things like that, it's okay. It's your experience. Uh, I've had a lot of them with um, trees emitting energy and bushes and things like that that just are unmistakable. There's some sort of a glow or whatever it is. And so this uh, seeking picked up an intensity somewhere around 30 years. And it um, it just became something that I thought about a lot at night. And uh, then I'd wake up. That's the big thing is that I always, it's, these things happen. I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I better get a pencil quickly because this thing's going to be gone. And so I turn the light on and write down whatever it was. And there's just a, I have a whole collection of stuff that I really enjoy that arrive so we can be um, things can happen to us and we just have to pay attention that they're happening and my favorite is to um, I do this with people I sponsor but I also can do it with myself and I'll go you know everything's all screwed up I'm sure everybody in this room has had that feeling. You you just go, you know, everything's all screwed up. And the answer is, wait a minute, let's take another look and make sure they're screwed up. You might have seen it wrong. So we're going to go back and re-examine all this. And we're going to ask God to help us take a look at what life is like. And all of a sudden, it's not screwed up. As a matter of fact, sometimes you will see how wonderful everything is, and you you were totally wrong. Absolutely wrong. One way of sponsoring people is when they have problems is to invite them over and talk them out of the fact they have a problem and disagree that that's a problem. No, you're seeing it wrong. You are looking at it incorrectly. Let's look at it this way. And, I, I, geez, I remember that happened early in sobriety. My sponsor, I'd come running over. It's, in my, it's probably in every talk I've given that the sky was falling again. You know, I got two years sobriety. I'm getting thrown out of the Marine Corps, whatever the hell's going on. So I got to go see him. And um, I come over and I go, everything's wrong. My cousin says, well, what is it? Well, this is, uh, my wife isn't happy and the children are hungry. And the Marine Corps is going to go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting, you know, but you've got, uh, what have you got now, 18 months? And I say, yeah. You know, people really like the way you t- talk at meetings. Have you noticed that? As a matter of fact, they want you to come back to Manassas. Really? And if you think about it, your health is returning. You're starting to run now. You're starting to take care of yourself. And he would start through this whole list of things. And when he finished, I'd go, well, if you look at it that way, (laughs) I guess things are okay. So it wasn't what was really going on. It was what I was seeing that was incorrect. And there's a lot of power in that. A disease of perception. So if our perception is off, our life is going to look uncomfortable and not on target when it really is. Um, so those, those happen. And then... Um, Between 38 and 41 years, the most change took place more than all the other years combined in terms of change in perception. Uh, I became so connected to Chuck Chamberlain's teachings, even though he had already been a hero of mine. And if you don't know who he is, you better find out. Because he was um, 
one of the great teachers in AA. And um, his talks, the new pair of glasses. As a matter of fact, uh, la- did we go last year, Chris, out to Laguna? I wanted to just go back and be around Chuck's energy and go by his house where he lived. He didn't live there anymore. And go to some of the groups that um, he went to. It was a fun visit. It was, yeah, you guys were there. And um, I got to talk at a couple of them. And it was just um, something I never would have done 15 years earlier. This suddenly was, this man influenced your life. Let's go back and thank him. Let's go back and review. I haven't been there since the 80s. 1980 may have been the last time. He died in 82. And um, that was a wonderful visit. And it was just to experience the energy that I remember from him. So we have, um, we have some good teachers in AA, and there's a lot of them in this room. And it's, um, if you're new and you're sponsoring people, you can pay attention to develop your own style, but there are things that you can learn from some of these other people. The answers to give, the stories to tell, the things that will, and, and you can see yourself how it's working by watching the, person you're sponsoring and if you see them with light bulbs going off all the time you're obviously on the right track and they're 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 going oh i get it because we got to remember when we come in here and we start talking about spiritual things it's like talking about ghosts yeah well don't forget the ghosts in the room and nobody can see it so they go yeah spiritual so they say the word but until you experience it and have a sense of it, it's just a theory that, it, that this is true. Funny that um, Ernie Kurtz says that the saying that AA is spiritual, not religious, has no origin. No one knows where it came from. It's not in our literature. He didn't have it in any of his. It just appeared. And he said that for AA to make spirituality acceptable in the society was almost equal to making religion acceptable. I mean, it's, it's, it's that high. A, and so the, the, the only way they were able to do it was through results. And when you see one miracle after another, even our biggest skeptic, when their cousin gets sober, who's the biggest jerk in their family, they have to ch- start changing their mind about Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, maybe that spirituality is valid. Everything in our program is connected with results. It is, um, that's why I like it so much. Um, what time is it? Is it time? Five minutes? Then I'll, t- I'll have to talk about Chris for five minutes. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm glad I uh, got on that track of um, seeking. As a matter of fact, that's our kind of our motto, is seek and you will find. If you decide to become a seeker, you will follow it. You will just, you will be led to certain books. You'll be led to certain program on on television or something. Well, we have now the spiritual speaker, so-and-so, which a month ago you go, now listen to that jerk. And suddenly you find yourself listening. And now this door is opening. And this door is opening, and all of a sudden, you're seeing a light that was 
quite a bit brighter than the one you ever saw before. And you realize that it's working. Your decision to become a seeker. So we've always, we like to end a lot of our lectures here urging people to take that word up as a personal label for yourself. Who are you? I'm a spiritual seeker. And see where it takes you. I'm sure you're going to be delighted. You, you will have personal experiences that you wouldn't have had otherwise. And so I wish you a lot of luck with that. And with that, we'll close. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.